I'm going to speak uh, just for about 15 minutes on certification. So you're all in the middle of a seven-year residency program, and what I'm going to do is, is um, just give you an overview of the certification process. You're all familiar with the written exam that you do, which must be passed uh, for credit by the time that you finish your residency program or else you don't graduate, as you know. And so what I'm going to show you is I used to run the oral exam uh, I ran it for six years at the American Board, and you'll be sitting for your oral exam within about four years of completion of your residency. And that's the final process and the final milestone uh, towards certification. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a, a set of slides as to how we run the oral exam and how we tell guest examiners to behave during the exam. So this is a, a sort of an insider's view of, of, of how we execute the exam and what we expect out of the candidates, okay? And um, so all of you are, will have completed a seven-year residency program. You've passed the written exam to complete your residency. You, you submit your application and you're scheduled within five years. This is gonna go to four years, I think. And then um, 150 cases of operative data are reviewed. And when you were, you're going you're gonna to give basically 150 cases, we used to do it a year of cases, but we found such variability in the experience of some candidates that uh, we felt 150 cases we needed to be able to review the quality of the data. And, um, and then you may get uh, people asking questions to clarify uh, some of the outcomes on those patients. Um, we also audit now the data review with your hospital on a percentage of cases just to make sure that people are including all of their cases in there and not excluding any particular cases. And then you submit letters of recommendation, evidence of licensure, and then current hospital um, appointments. So the examination is three hours long. And um, we changed the exam during the time that I ran. It, it, it used to be divided into cranial cases, spinal cases, and then other. But what we, we do now is we treat the exam just like anybody going to an emergency room, is that you don't know where the pathology is located a priori before you see the patient. So we mix them all up, but then we extract the subspecialty areas out in the evaluation process at the end by looking at the grading of the different cases within each of the hours, okay? So these are the topics that are covered all of uh, neurosurgery that you're all familiar with, that you're all training in right now. And there's, in each of the hours, there's two examiners. There's a board member, um, and then there's a guest examiner. And the guest examiners are usually people, that are senior people that are well-established in the community, or they're program directors, but not board members, okay? So they're all fairly experienced people. So we ask the candidates to introduce themselves, and then we, we don't try to trick anybody with the exam. It's a straightforward exam. We want to make sure, we want to really evaluate what you know. And it's amazing uh, with experienced examiners how we can uh, determine exactly what you know. So we don't ask where the candidate works or trains. We don't give any verbal feedback as to how the candidate is doing. We don't lead them in any way. And we don't let them flounder. If they're having trouble, we move on because it's to the candidate's benefit if we get through more questions and more vignettes during the hour. Um, and we don't ask trick questions or we don't ask for didactic material. What we're trying to determine is if you're safe and we wanna know how you're going to manage the patient. We also understand there's lots of different ways to treat a patient and we uh, understand we're open-minded as to different avenues of treatment or different ways of doing this operation, but we, um, we really just wanna know what you would do so what we do is we simulate actual clinical encounters in the ER, in the office, et cetera, and then the candidates can actively participate so that you can ask, well, did you do um, you know, a CBC? What do the white counts show, et cetera? You, it's, a, it's a dialogue back and forth, and uh, the candidates are expected to provide rationale for their decision-making process. So what we do is, this is a typical vignette, and we'll do six or seven of these usually during the hour, so each one lasts about nine or 10 minutes. We try to get through as many as possible because if somebody bombs on one of them, it's to their advantage that we get through more, statistically. So uh, we'll ask you to, um, the, we'll give you the presentation of the patient, I'll give you an example of a case, 
Uh, we look at test results and image. We ask you to, to uh, create a differential diagnosis that's reasonable. And then we want you to go ahead and manage the patient. If the patient requires surgery, we'll ask you details about the surgical procedure, the planning, and then we'll give you a complication usually that you'll have to manage. It could be intraoperative, it could be perioperative complication, it could be a postoperative complication in the ICU, for instance. And then also we'll ask you the post-op management. If the patient doesn't need a surgery, then we'll ask you the natural history of that disease. Say it's an MS plaque and you've decided you don't want to operate on it, but you want to treat the patient, then we're going to ask you how would you treat the patient and what's the natural history of the disease. And that's important because the grade's given based on that as well. So again, we ask a minimum of six questions per hour. Uh, we move on if they're floundering, and we focus on judgment, and we're open to alternative solutions. And it's a comprehensive exam. So even if you're a pediatric neurosurgeon, we expect you for this exam to understand the, the, the concepts and basics around peripheral nerve, uh, et cetera. So this is how the exam is graded. We give you three separate grades for each of these tasks. Diagnosis, creating a good differential and coming to the correct diagnosis. Management of the patient, we give double weighting for this grade. And then complications, so we give you a complication to manage. Now, if we don't operate on the patient, then we expect we give a grade based on the natural history of the disorder and the outcome of the disorder. It's a five-point grading scale, quite intuitive, something we've all grown up with, A, B, C, D, F, um, and these are all the verbal uh, descriptions of the, but basically we want people to achieve a three or better, a C or better across the exam. So each hour is graded, and we develop a composite grade, so each vignette is graded specifically and then at the end of the hour, we derive a composite grade, which is what are basically, it's a uh, overall assessment of the candidate based on each of those three tasks. And then are there safety issues? This is probably the biggest one that we deal with because we have some people that have, have a terrible vignette and have a terrible outcome. And then we have a lot of discussion about whether that's a fatal flaw or not, okay? Uh, so it depends on, um, the exam is actually graded by the psychometricians ultimately, and the pass point is determined by a psychometric analysis. And it's important to understand that they have a long history of the people who are continuous test givers like me. They know exactly how severe I am with my grading. So what happens is, is that all of the examiners are evaluated as to the severity of the grading. So ultimately, the pass point is determined based on the severity of the question, the severity of the examiner, and it's normalized, and then the pass point is given to us a couple of weeks after the exam, and then we determine where the passing grade is and who passes and who fails. So these are the three subject areas that are gleaned from the, all the three hours, and we develop a, a grade for cranial, a grade for spine, and a grade for this critical care and other, which includes neurology, functional pediatrics, and peripheral nerve if it wasn't included in the spine. And we now made a requirement that based, we expect this, this is a comprehensive test, and we expect all of the candidates to pass all three of these different areas. So what we do is we have a discussion period after the exam is given, and um, there's, there's people that are clearly passed, people are going to pass well, and those people are clearly going to fail, and the people on the bubble are the ones that we discuss. And we then go through the questions and answers and understand why a candidate did poorly. And then there's an opportunity for the board director to be able to change the grade of the guest examiner if we thought it was an unfair grade. So we'd, we'd go ahead and discuss it, and then we basically throw it to the psychometricians at this point, and then they determine where the pass point is. It's to be, there is no vote on pass-fail, and then the computer analysis determines the pass-fail standard, subject to board review about two weeks after the exam process. And again, this is adjusted for the severity of the examiner, the question severity, and the task severity. There's one other thing that I want to mention, 
and we, we put this form on the grading form and uh, uh, this question on the grading, are there safety concerns? Because if we feel that a candidate is unsafe, we, we can actually bring this up and this will weigh into the grading and this may decrease if somebody's on the bubble we may use that as a determination of whether we think that they should pass or fail. So I want you to know that this is the overarching principle <laughs> for this entire exam, is is this candidate safe? Are they making a reasonable judgment and proceeding with reasonable treatment? So I'll just give you a two minute example of a case that could be presented. This is not a standard case. About half the examination now is standard cases, but this is not one of them. So this is one of my old cases that I gave many years ago, but here's a woman with who's been insulin dependent diabetic for 30 years, hypertension, and um, she has hearing loss and anxiety, and um, she presents, uh, and she's on um, glucophage, and you can see all the meds that she's on, and on examination, this is what she looks like, and obviously there's coarse features here, and a good candidate would clearly recognize that this is an acromegalic patient, so. We don't expect a medical student differential diagnosis for this. We expect people to be practical and say, this patient has acromegaly. You know, she's got diabetes and she's got heart problems as well. And, and so the, quickly they expect them to go ahead and order an MRI and you can see her hands compared to one of our residents here. And um, here's her MRI which demonstrates a pituitary tumor, a little bit of enlargement here. And um, you can see the tumor right here. And then uh, we'd expect them to do an endocrine evaluation, know what tests to order, and the results show here that the growth hormone is elevated, IGF-1 is elevated, and then they go ahead with appropriate treatment, which would be surgical treatment as the initial treatment. And then we may give them a complication intraoperatively to manage, and then expect a postoperative, and we may give them that they didn't cure the patient with surgery alone, so what would be other uh, adjuvant treatments that you, be, you would consider for this patient. So that's an example of the types of cases that would be presented. So I just wanted to um, mention the Goodman Oral Board Prep course, which is put on by Alan Levy. He's done a fantastic job over the years at uh, putting this course together. But what, what they do is they do a very similar case-based simulation of the examination across a broad range of topics in all those areas that I mentioned. And uh, I think it works out that every uh, candidate uh, going through the examination um, actually goes to at least one of those courses. And so it's really, uh, it's routine now for everybody to do that. And it's been a, a terrific, and we can really tell people when they've been prepared properly. Um, and the course is given twice a year, usually the week before the, the oral exam in Houston, Texas. These are the dates for the next ones. And so, my last topic I would like to talk about is just MOC, and this is maintenance of certification. So you get your primary certification, and then you, all of you in the audience, are going to have to maintain that on an annual basis. Now this is a moving target. When I was certified um, back in the early 90s, and when Rich and, and Jim, uh, we, we're all grandfathered in. We have lifetime certificates. I'm actually in MOC. I do it voluntarily. But, um, but all of you are going to have time-limited certificates. And it's a moving target, and I'm going to show you where we're at as a snapshot today and where it's likely going to go uh, over the next few years. And I, was, um, I asked Vince Trainellis for these because he's the chair of the MOC committee at the ABNS, the board, and he gave me the slides that he presented at their most recent retreat about it. And so... Um, these are the number of diplomates that are participating in MOC, just over 2,000, and you can see a view of us are doing voluntary recertification, and, um, and everybody who is certified since 1999 is required uh, to be enrolled in MOC. And we expect MOC will equate to MOL, maintenance of licensure in states, within the ensuing few years as well. So this is tracked. Uh, on the ABNS website, MOC login here, and it's getting a lot of airplay. ABMS is now really promoting it in all specialties, um, and some specialties are much more rigorous than ours right now. My wife's actually a pediatrician, and she has to do it every year now. So, um, 
So the primary aims for ABMS MOC is to reduce medical errors and improve practice performance along patient, with patient outcomes through a process of continuous professional improvement. So that's their um, mission. Uh, the new MOC standards are ensuing, and these are the four standards that we've been currently working under. There's four categories of MOC. One is professionalism, two, lifelong learning, three, knowledge assessment, by way of a test, and four, improvement in medical practice. And the big changes are in part four. In addition, there's an overlay now of two general standards. GS1, and you in the, in the room are all familiar with these because this is your six core competencies that are part of the milestones that you're living with right now. So the, these are now being overlaid on MOC. And uh, GS2, general standard two, increased value with MOC program monitoring. So, the part one is fairly uh, straightforward and rudimentary. It's basically evidence of professionalism, professional standing, so that you're a good citizen, that you've still got uh, credentialing in your hospital, etc. cetera. Uh, part two is lifelong learning and self-assessment. And uh, these are, uh, the goal is to establish requirements and document that diplomates are meeting learning and self-assessment requirements and integrate patient safety principles into MOC programs. So this is where it's going. Um, there's four mechanisms for complying with part two right now. Uh, that's like using the SANS and you'll see when you, when you log onto the website when you're in practice, you can go ahead and take the SANS with no charge for MOC. And then there's MOC review course um, given both by the Congress and also by the NS. And then we're just actually starting, Bob Harbaugh and I and Mitch Berger, a NS a review, a yearly review book that will be an ongoing iterative up update every year that you can uh, participate with MOC. Part three is basically the assessment of knowledge, which is classically um, the test. And uh, it's an ongoing examination. It's given once every 10 years, but probably will become more frequently. It may become uh, every three years. In, in some specialties, it's ongoing every year. Basically, the problem that we have right now, the test is, is done yearly, and it's usually uh, given in academic centers. We give it to the neurosurgeons in Utah, for instance, in our office every March, uh, the same day that, that you take your written exam when you're a resident. And um, the proposal is to start taking the test from home and making it more relevant to the education materials that are designed to prepare the candidate for this. So, so for instance, with the Goodman Oral Board course, it, it simulates beautifully the real test. But there's a disconnect between the SANS and the review course and the test, and we're going to try and coordinate that a little bit better so that it'll make it more practical and more relevant. And then uh, we'll propose taking the test from home uh, no proctor, uh, increase in time allowed. And um, so that's in progress and will change definitely uh, by the time that you uh, get involved with this process. And then part four is the big one where it's in evolution right now. Um, this is one that's a little hard to grasp, but basically the idea is to incorporate an ongoing practice assessment and improvement into the MOC program. And so the way it's been currently done is every uh, person involved in MOC puts 10 key cases in. Uh, so say you're a, uh, an epilepsy surgeon, you can use temporal lobectomy and, and use that as a key case. And then what you can do is, is you take 10 consecutive key cases and compare them to um, the, the rest of the um, individuals using that key case nationally. And you can see how your results compare nationally uh, with your peers. Um, we're going to make it, it's going to be made a little more rigorous because we felt it was, um, it was really a nominal uh, effort initially, the, the key cases, we understood that. But it's going to have more teeth, and the idea is that uh, it's going to be an expanded part four. It'll be much more ongoing daily use uh, for you by the time you're in practice. Um, so the idea is that we want to use some of the existing reporting mechanisms that we're doing. So we're looking for ways of people involving, for instance, with N2Q, do that you heard about, is whether they could use part of their that data for their ongoing MOC part four. Um, the standards emphasize relevance to the neurosurgical practice. 
specific quality improvement aims and cooperative learning and analysis of data from practice by using registry data. Um, so we're thinking about having an essentials module, for instance, where it would be a boiled down uh, limited uh, database uh, project, registry project that you put in almost half of your cases over time and we'd monitor the outcomes for that at the board level. So these are these multi-institutional registry programs, uh, quality improvement projects. Here. And so we're thinking about a portfolio of different options to qualify for part four that people could participate in. Manuscript development, practice improvement modules, et cetera. So this is all in flux and will uh, be definitely changed over the next few years. The idea that NPA, which is NeuroPoint Alliance, will serve as a primary portfolio sponsor and data management partner, and you'd collect all your registry data and all your quality improvement projects on the database, and then it would be monitored by the ABNS on an ongoing basis.